I am big rich 87 says what in your opinion and experience is a desired rep range to build muscle and strength. Uh, I mean, you're always going to build muscle and strength, right? Like, I know there are two different things too. I mean, look, if you're lifting in a three rep range, you're going to build muscle, right? You're not, you're not going to not build muscle. It's just what's optimal. So optimally, I feel like you want to be in the six to 12 range, maybe eight to 12 range to build for the most hypertrophy, right? Uh, if you're working on building strength and not worried about building volume to the muscle, um, you're probably more likely going to lift in the three to five range, even, even singles or doubles. So they do, there is a differentiation. I just don't like it when people say, well, you're not going to build muscle. If you do three rep sets, you are going to build muscle. You're just not going to build as much muscle as you would if you did more set, more reps because the, the muscle is going to have more volume to it. Right. So um, yeah, so that's, that's the two you're looking at lower range reps for strength, anywhere from singles to doubles, three to five rep max, probably. Uh, and you're probably more in the eight to 12, even you can go six to eight sometimes, but I would say eight to 12 in the hypertrophy range to actually build voluminous muscle. Seller Mike says, will tattoos hinder your appearance on stage? Uh, they could. I have two tattoos, but they don't hinder, hinder my look because they're not that big and they don't cover any deep lines. But like, I know some guys that have their whole back tattooed, that's going to definitely hurt you. Like they have tan that can cover up those tattoos, but the tan almost makes your skin look thicker. So it hurts your conditioning a little bit while it's covering up your tattoo. So I think if you want to have a successful career in bodybuilding, get a forearm tattoo. You know, Ian's got a forearm tattoo. Just Chris Bumstead's got a forearm tattoo or get a tattoo on your back. Just don't make it like your whole back. Like I have one on my back. It's like just in the center of my back. Um, there are different ways to get tattoos to, to make sure they're not obscuring the way the muscle looks. Max Moritz says, when you make a workout video, can you type it in below exercise sets, reps of type of thing? Uh, yeah, I'll get right on that, Max. <laughs> yeah. You know, guys, I, I do my best to bring you guys information and it just seems like it, it's just never enough. Um, you know, we're working on a trainer. I'm working on a daily trainer. And when it's released, it will have all the sets, reps and exercises and everything. We have an ebook that I released. The ebook on the website, if you check it out, it has all the sets, reps, you know. Uh, you know, sometimes people want everything for free. And we do a lot. I, I give a lot back through this podcast, through my podcast, through these Q and A's for free. If you want more, you can always buy more, right? Like we have Justin Harris is on our team. He's a, an amazing coach. If you need more detail, hire a coach. If you need uh, sets and reps for a program, buy the ebook. There are many different ways to get more information um, than for free, right? I mean, you're getting plenty of free information. You know, you might want to just pop open the wallet once in a while and, um, you know, pay, if you want more information, pay for it. You can, there's, it's always there for you. Alex, Alex Scott Nelson. Sorry guys. You talk about the importance of going to failure, but how many failure sets do you include in your workout? Also, when do you go to failure? Do you like failing at predetermined number of sets or do you just do as many reps as you can until you reach failure? Uh, failure is usually the last set of an exercise. So if I do four exercises for a workout, there's four failure sets. That doesn't mean four working sets because usually the set before the failure set is also a working set. But the last set is usually a failure set, meaning I've decided that whatever number I did previously, like let's say on the third set I did, let's say I'm doing four sets for bench press, right? And on the third set I did 315 and I did it for six, but I could have done 10 but I was just counting to six. Okay, I'm gonna do that 315 again, but I'm gonna try and hit 10. And if I hit 10, I'm gonna try and hit 11. If I hit 11, I'm gonna go and try hit 12. So the failure set means, could mean you're gonna use the same weight again, but go to failure with it, meaning you're not gonna stop until you literally, you literally can't do a set or even a rep or even, even half a rep. Sometimes I'll go until I'm half repping and then I'll be like, okay, now I'm done. Um, or it could mean uh, for your third set, you did 275 and you did it for eight time, eight reps. And you're like, okay, I'm going to go up and go to 315. 
and do six or eight reps. Uh, and then that 315 would be your failure. You fail at six or fail at eight, and then that's your last set. So, and then failure can also be a number of different things, right? Like failure could be, I did 315 for six. I failed at six, but then I stripped a plate off. And now I did, I did 225 again for another six. And then I stripped a plate off and I did 135 again for 10 more reps. And then I, now I can't move at all. I'm done. And, okay. And if I really want to, I can strip off and do the bar until I can't move a period. Right. But you wouldn't do that. But, but like the term failure can be applied in many different ways. You can fail on one set. You can fail on a rest pause. You can fail on a drop set. You can fail. How hard you want the muscle to fail is in your control, right? For some programs, you don't want to, maybe you don't want to beat yourself down to a pulp. So you're like, I'm not going to do failure, then rest pause failure, then drop set failure all at once. You know, all I want to do is fail on this one set. So I'm going to put 315 on the bar. I'm going to do as many times as I can. I got six clean reps. Maybe I'm going to do two or three more partials and then I'm going to get my partner to take it and I'm going to rack the weight. Or if you're like, you know what, I'm kind of an advanced lifter. I feel like I need more torment to the muscle. Then you're going to do your 315. You're going to pause, wait for 10 seconds. You're going to do 315 again. Then you're going to pause for 10 or 15 seconds and you might strip a plate off and do 225 again. And you'll go until you've actually destroyed the muscle completely for that one set. So failure encompasses many different meanings um, and it's applied many different ways. But for me, I apply it as in just the last set of each exercise. JCS, JC Swan 87 says, was wondering if you're going to come out with an ebook or trainer soon. Thank you for all the content. There's an ebook on the website. It's actually great. It has a, has a sample diet in it and a, a way for you to bring down your calories so you can get shredded. And it also has a very detailed four week program in there. Um, it, it doesn't just count the sets and reps for you. It actually gives you explanations of each exercise and how you should be doing them. So you guys can check out the ebook at hostile.com. As far as the trainer, I'm going to be working on a trainer right now because I'm about, I think I'm eight weeks out from my show this weekend. So I think we're going to document this last eight weeks uh, leading up to the show and then release that as a trainer. Don't hold me. Don't quote me on that. It's kind of in my head, but I haven't confirmed 100% yet. Uh, Zohair Kassam says, any plans for a standalone creatine product for Hostile? Maybe down the road. I, I think it might be cool down the road, like down, down the road to have like a bunch of raw ingredients under Hostile's banner, like, you know, Hostile creatine, Hostile glutamine, Hostile taurine, Hostile, hostile tyrosine. And then people can mix and match what they like. But as of now, it's, it's, it's definitely far down the road before we get into something like that. What's your opinion on the 36 raw egg diet from Vince Garanda? Uh, I think it's stupid, I guess. I don't know. I, look, anything can, if it works, great. Let's just put it that way. If, if you did 36 raw eggs a day and you got huge, more power to you. Keep doing it. Personally, I'm not drinking 36 raw eggs. So to me, it's stupid. Uh, I would rather eat my eggs uh, cooked. And I don't want to eat 36 of them because it's going to ruin my stomach and it's not going to feel very good. So uh, it's not for me. Sun and Chine 74 says, too bad you don't deliver to Germany. Uh, we, will, we are working on it, okay? So I want to explain something to you guys. A lot of you guys ask me, like, when are you going to be delivering here? When are you going to be delivering there? I think by January 1st, we're going to have our EU uh, warehouse set up and we'll be able to cover all of Europe uh, for shipping and it should be faster shipping and cheaper shipping. So I appreciate you guys, uh, you know, the excitement and the demand for the brand, but I also appreciate you guys being understanding that we're still growing slowly and um, we're working on getting things to you guys as soon as possible. The real Xavier Bond says, will the inner part of my chest grow as my chest grows or should I do movements for the inner middle chest? Uh, there isn't really an inner middle chest. So your chest is made up of an upper lower and then a pec minor, right? So, but you can stress, like the fibers run this way in your chest, right? They run across. You can stress the inner part of the fiber, right? There's no inner chest. Like there's not a separate piece here for your inner chest, but you can stress 
the inside of the muscle fibers by doing, you know, like hex press or doing flies or doing, you know, some movements that really emphasize the center of your chest um, to help build it. So your inner chest, you know, going back to your question, your inner chest will, should grow with your chest, like as your chest grows. But even me, like you can see, I don't know if you see through my shirt, but there's a gap here, right? There's a gap right here. It's like a good, you know, quarter inch, right? All the way through. And it, it meets right about here. So there's a gap down, down here. Not everybody has that. Like my training partner, Paul, his chest connects all the way to the bottom, but that's just, it's a genetic thing, right? Like no matter how many, like a hex press is when you put the dumbbells together and you push up, it fires the inside of my chest like crazy. No matter how many of those I do, this gap is always going to be there because that's genetic. Like you have, everybody has insertion points where their muscle inserts. It's like my bicep, right? Like some people's bicep is short. So it creates a higher peak and some biceps are long. So it creates like more of a hill instead of a peak. So your chest is the same way. Some of us have pecs that insert here. So there's a gap there. And some of us have pecs that insert like together. So there's no gap. So if you have a gap there and you can like, you're touching bone, you may never, you may never be able to fill that gap. It may always be there. Um, but regardless, you can still stress the inner part of your chest by doing hex press or doing cable crossovers or, you know, dumbbell flies. There's a lot of different movements you can get to do to, to stress that inner part of your chest. Andre Singh says, what kind of pre-workout do you recommend for someone who has never taken one stim or no, no stim? Uh, I don't think our, our stim pre-workout hostility has too much stim in it that it would make you go crazy. I think if you want to try it, I would probably start with half a scoop. So take half a scoop of hostility, see how it feels, see what the stim feels like, see what your energy is like, and then you can decide if you want to add a full scoop. Honestly, a lot of people are fine with half a scoop. A lot of people message me and say they take half a scoop of hostility because it's still it's still 13 grams in half a scoop. Like our full scoop is 26 grams, 26 and a half, which is like double everybody else's. So most people are used to taking, you know, 10 to 12, 13 gram scoops, which is what half of hostility is. So you could take half the hostility scoop, see how it feels. If you like the feeling, just keep taking half. If you feel like it didn't really do much and you want more, then take the full amount. Um, if you don't want stim at all, just take bloodshot. I could, you could take the full serving and you know, you're not going to, nothing weird is going to happen. You're not going to feel cracked out or too energized or anything like that. You're just going to get a really good pump. So uh, with bloodshot, you could probably try the full serving if you want, but again, you might not need it because the full serving is 32 grams. You can get away with half a serving is 16 grams. It's still more than everybody else on the most other companies on the market. So um, I would buy either one. If you want stim buy hostility, if you don't want stim buy bloodshot, and I would start with half a scoop or half a serving of each one and see how you like it and then increase from there if you need to. Um, from watching your podcast with Justin Harris, uh, CJNE95 says, from watching your podcast with Justin Harris, he spoke about whey isolate and how the body won't absorb it all as it passes through too quickly. Would a protein blend then be better than an isolate? Well, it depends. I personally want the isolate Okay. Let me say it this way. I think if you're trying to use a protein as a meal replacement, then maybe a blend makes sense. But I think if you want to slow it down, I would still use an isolate and just add a peanut butter, a scoop of peanut butter to it. And that will slow it down. But most likely, like for me, when I use protein powder, it's post-workout. I'm trying to get fat nutrients into my body fast. So I'm not sure if Justin's right about the absorption rate. I think it's going to vary from protein to protein, depending on how it's made, but I want it to be fast. I want it to get in as quickly as possible. And that's the benefit to using a whey isolate post-workout. That's where all the studies are done. All the studies, not all, I shouldn't say all the studies, the majority of studies are done on protein, on whey protein isolate when they're, when they're talking about performance. So uh, that's what we're going to release is a whey protein isolate because I think that's the most beneficial to what we're trying to do. I'm not, when I'm ready to release a meal replacement, it probably won't be made with isolate, but right now all of our products are performance products. They're, they're made to help you perform better or just be a better bodybuilder. And that's why the protein fits in well, because 
that's what whey isolate is for is for your performance and recovery. So putting it, um, putting a really fast digesting protein post-workout is exactly what our body wants when we're done. Craig Knowles one says, Hani always seems to get his competitors freaky 3D. What is his coaching and training style different from others? And also would love to see Hani Rambot on the podcast. Well, Hani is not going to be on the podcast because he's passed probably two or three times. So I don't, I don't ask anybody after they pass a couple of times. Um, so Hani won't be on the podcast, unfortunately, uh, unless he calls and asks me, which I don't, don't think is going to happen because yeah, I don't think, I just think he's got his own podcast now. I don't, I don't think he wants to do interviews. I don't know. So that's fine. Uh, as far as his athletes being freaky 3d, I think the type of athletes you train helps, right? Like, I mean, Hani has been very fortunate to pick athletes that are very good genetically. So not taking anything away from Hani's coaching style. I just don't think there's anything about it that is dramatically better. He, the one thing I could say about Hani is he's very good at getting the best out of his athletes. So he makes his athletes work to their potential. So when you combine that with the genetic specimens he's been working with, you get a really, really good athlete. And I think that's what's been happening. He's getting guys that are genetically gifted uh, more so than the rest of us, like Phil Heath or Jay Cutler or, you know, Jeremy Buendia or name the athlete, right? They're all very, excuse me, they're all very genetically gifted. And then when you add Hani's coaching style, which is like, Hey, are you training? Are you training? Are you training? Like, are you on it? And he gets the most out of his athletes that way. You end up getting a very good product at the end. But as far as like, the methods he uses, there's nothing that, you know, we did together anyway. You know, I worked with Hani for two or three years. There's nothing that we did that's dramatically different. Um, like as far as food set up or anything like that. Hank Hill says, since Mr. Olympia has been moved to December, will you have a booth at the expo this year? Uh, I don't think so. I think it's a little too soon for us still. Um, I think we hope to have one next year. KW Peter 93 says, have you guys, have you guys on a training day experienced this? You ate your meals up to training, drank plenty of water, got a good rest the night before you go train and there's no pump or contraction in the muscle, but the next day you're sore as fuck. I'm sure it has to do with electrolytes, but maybe there's another reason. Um, I haven't experienced that. Usually if I'm sore the next day, it's because I had a really good workout. If I had a really good workout, usually I got a really good pump. So I don't know. I don't really know how to answer that. Cause I don't, if I get sore, that means I had a great workout. Right. And if I had a great workout, I, I can't think of a workout. I, I thought I can't think of a workout I had that was amazing. That didn't give me a great pump. So yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, Stella Liciousness says, any plans on releasing dry fit apparel? I don't think so. Maybe in the future. I'm not a huge fan of it myself, but uh, it could be something we'll look into. Haseeb Akhtar says, hey, how many meals should be done in a week for each muscle group? Wait, I read that wrong. I apologize. How many sets should be done in a week for each muscle group? For example, I'm doing arms two times a week. And how many sets should I do total for one week? Don't count it for the week, count it for the workout. So if you're doing arms, you generally want to do nine to 12 sets, nine to 12 sets per arm workout. Okay. So just don't complicate things by counting it for how many sets per week per workout. What are you doing? That's, that's kind of the way you should look at it. Eric Shun says, is it okay for guys with smaller bills to use your products? I look nothing like you or your friends. I'm only five, nine, one seventy five. Eric, our products are made for people that are serious, but they're not made for just bodybuilders. They're made for anybody who wants a really good product and is really serious about the products they put in their body. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're a hundred pounds, 200 pounds or 300 pounds, a good pump product is going to be a good pump product and a good pre-workout is going to be a good pre-workout and essential aminos are going to be necessary, whether you're a hundred pounds or 300 pounds and you just started training or you've been advanced. Um, there's nothing about our products that a beginner can't take or shouldn't take. And there's nothing about our products that an, an advanced lifter doesn't need. So it is extremely important for me to, to emphasize that 
there's no there's no secrets like people think like well because things have to be drastically different because i'm a beginner and when i'm intermediate i can do this differently and i can do that differently i'll tell you guys the truth man my training and diet and nutrition has been the same for 20 years sure my diets become a little little more refined i don't eat as much junk and i know more about nutrition so i don't eat like you know chef boy rd for my carbs and shit but overall my methods are the same bulk hard get big diet hard get shredded you know be left left with 10 pounds of muscle that year um you know train your ass off train to failure on the last set of extra every exercise have a good working set for the, the one before that um train you know do a pro split where you train one or two body parts a day uh, that's just all of these things have worked for me since day one take pre-workouts and take protein powders and take I never thought like when I started, I wasn't like, well, I'm not an intermediate yet. So I can't take protein powder and I can't take pre-workouts. I can't take, get all the stuff you know how to get and start it right away. If you know, if you know that our pre-workout is the best pre-workout on the market and you're just starting out, grab that pre-workout and use it to the best of your ability. Start with half a scoop, get to feeling and then increase from there. But there is no difference. I mean, look, it's we're all just trying to build muscle it doesn't matter if you just started yesterday or if you've been doing it for 20 years like me we're just trying to build muscle and eating and training your ass off is the way to build muscle so don't think i'm new i have to go get some pre-workout that doesn't work because i'm new no it's actually more important for you to take a good pre-workout because you're new and you you need to help in the gym you need the recovery you need you know the push past those failure sets so a good pre-workout can help you do that. So yeah, I don't, I don't want people to get that impression that they need to be professional bodybuilders to use our products. That's not, that's not the case at all. Uh, H Jock says, what movements helped you grow your quads the most? You know, honestly, the, the best, this is going to sound so barbaric, but the best meathead year, the best, the best quad building year I had, I didn't do any fluffy shit. I think I literally did leg press, squats, and hack squats every week. And nothing else, just those three exercises. And I would do like eight sets of each. And somebody said to me, you want you to do some lunges? Why don't you do some leg extensions? I'm like, they're not going to build as much mass. I'm not doing it. I'm sticking to only the exercises that are going to help me build mass. Those are the only ones I care about. And it worked. It worked. I would go in, I would do seven, eight, nine sets of leg press, you know, four, five, six sets of squats, another four or five, six sets of uh, hack squats. And before I knew it, my legs have blown up. So, you know, I don't, uh, now looking back, I, I think it might've been, it was probably would have been good for me to do some leg extensions, do some walking lunges, things that would maybe would have created a little more shape for my legs. But just putting on sheer mass, I don't know, there's not really much you can beat when it comes to leg press, hack squats and squats. Those are the mass building exercises. Grizzly Gym Rat says, what is something you pros do to help with your discipline? Is there training techniques you work for your mind to keep that strong? Uh, no, it's just not wanting to be shit. So there, there's no more, you know, I've said the speech over and over again. I don't want to say it again, but there's no, the, the motivation is awesome. Okay. I love motivation. I love when, I hit a YouTube channel by accident and it's some guy's training his ass off. I'm like, man, I gotta go to the gym or like a Machiavelli motivation puts out a, uh, a new training video with Ronnie and Dorian and they're killing it. And I'm like, Oh, I'm motivated. I want to get to the gym, but that's such a small fraction of time. It's like, like if this is, a, if this is the line, right. When I see like a Dorian video, it'll go like this. And then it's back to normal. There's like a little bump and then back to normal. That's it. That's all I get. I get like five minutes. Oh, okay. Dorian's awesome. I gotta get off the couch and go to the gym. The rest of it's fueled by me, right? There's, there's, there's no lasting motivation where like, you're just always motivated. Like whether you you just saw the video or whether it's like you saw it yesterday, you're still motivated. That's not how it works. Your motivation comes from within. You have to, you have to remind yourself, I want to be great. I want to get to the Olympia. I want to win a show. I want to look awesome. I want to have abs. I want to, whatever it is you want to do, 
that's your motivation. That the way I stay motivated is it's right here. It's the focal point is here at all times, right? It's not like, oh man, I saw this Dorian video and I got really amped up and I'm ready to go to the gym now. Yeah, okay. But that wore off five minutes later. Now what's there? What's left? Nothing. It's you in your head. You in your own head, are, that's all there is, right? And what you got to do to keep your motivation is keep your goal that you had in your mind, keep it right in the front. Keep it right here, right? Because a lot of people will wake up and they'll have a, a thought right here and they'll think, I want to be great. I want to have a great physique. I want to look like Simeon Panda. I want to have a small waist and big shoulders and a big back and I want to be real good looking and that's it. I'm working it, right? Because they saw a picture of Simeon Panda come up on their on their Instagram. But like an hour later, they're like, okay, they finished their cardio. They're having their breakfast. Like, oh, I'm really hungry. You know what? I think I'm going to have a muffin with my breakfast. I don't need to look like Simeon Panda. That's what motivation does. It fucking goes away. It disappears, right? It's there when you see the photo. An hour later, you forgot the photo. It's gone now. That's why motivation sucks. That's why you can't rely on motivation. Motivation is a spark, right? Motivation is a spark, and then there has to be fire and fuel. The spark is only, how long does a spark last? That's a spark, gone, right? Then there has to be fuel and fire, and that fuel and fire is right here. Because you saw the picture of Simeon Panda, right? And you're like, oh, this guy looks amazing. And then you're like, I want to look like that. So you create the vision in your mind of what you would look like if you, lo if you looked like, if you had his physique. That has to stay there. That's what drives me. If you ask me what drives you to go to the gym, that's what drives me. I saw Dorian Yates one day and I was like, holy shit, motivation. Then what happened was I'm like, how can I look like that? Right? And I started to formulate a plan. And then I started to figure out how to effectively execute the plan. What do I have to do next? What steps do I have to take? Okay, I have to go to the gym this much. Okay, I have to eat this many meals. Okay, I have to take these supplements. Okay, I have to, oh, I have to do it every day. Oh, I got to eat every two hours. Oh, this is a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. But it's stuck there. So nothing changes. It's every day, every day, 24 seven. And the same is going to apply to any other thing in your life that you want to be great at. You, you, you started a business. Guess what? I started a business, right? What's the first thing that happens? You look at another business and you go, holy shit, look at this business. Then it's stuck there. And it's like, okay, I want to have that. How do I have that? Then you got to formulate a plan. Then you create the plan and you go, okay, how do I get there? Oh, I got to do that. I got to do this thing every day. I got to wake up and do this. I got to have this meeting and that meeting. And I got to, the motivation is simply a spark right? Then your fuel is what's in your mind is the fuel for the fire, right? And if your mind is weak or the vision's not strong or you don't really want it, you just thought you wanted it, that fuel's gone, right? There's no fire now. If you really want something, you create a plan after you see the spark, after you see the vision that you want, after you get the motivation, you take that motivation and you formulate a plan and you put in your mind what it is that you want to look like or what, what your business is going to look like, what, what home you want to own, what car you want to buy, whatever the motivation is, whatever the thing you want is, you, you have that set up and then you start working. That's discipline, right? That's why people say motivation is fleeting. Discipline is forever. Because that's the, that's the thing that carries you through. The spark disappears, and then the discipline is the fuel. The thing that gets you out of bed every morning and takes your ass to the fucking gym to do your cardio. The thing that brings you home and has you cook your meals when you don't feel like eating, you don't feel like cooking, doing the dishes when the sink is full because you have to cook another meal and get it in or pack your food when you go to work and take it all in a Tupperware and a big fridge. All that shit, that's what carries you through. That's the work. That's the discipline. Don't, don't think motivation is going to carry you through anything. Nobody ask me about motivation anymore. Nobody bring up the word motivation anymore. Motivation is nothing. Motivation is a spark in time and then it's gone. 
the discipline, the work, the want, the desire, the passion, those are the things that carry you through to your ultimate goal, not the picture that you saw of somebody or the video you saw of somebody or you know, you saw somebody with a flashy car and you're like, oh, I want to own that, but you don't really feel it. You just like, oh, I'd love to have one of those. That's nothing. That, that's, that won't get you anywhere. Learn to do the work. Learn, learn to formulate the plan and do the steps as they come at you and take every challenge as it comes at you and you will fall a thousand times, but you'll keep going. And then that discipline will carry you to your goal. And that's the longest winded answer I've ever given <laughs> to, to a question. So I apologize to you guys, but that kind of thing gets me worked up because it's so easy to just be like, to just see a video of somebody be like, oh man, I really want that. Yeah, but it's, it's so hard. And it's not because bodybuilding is hard because I'm applying this to any profession anywhere. It's so hard to take something that's just a thought and develop it and work on it and take time, years, years and years and years to really see this thing through, right? Not many people can do that. And if you ever become successful in life, that means you're one of the people that did it. You're one of the people that had a thought, developed a plan, and pushed yourself every single day, whether you were pissed off, depressed, sad, happy, motivated, not motivated, you're the one who made it. While the other people who are waiting for more motivation are just sitting there wishing they were you, right? You, you, everybody has that tool. It's just, you have to bring it out of yourself. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe, share with your friends and like the video. And if you get a chance, check out the description for all the different links to all the different places you can find Hostile and myself. And lastly, check out Hostile.com for our new line of supplements and all of our apparel and gear. Thanks again for watching.